have a Paul Finkelman baseball card. Uh, and on it, it says Albany Law School, who owns the ball, the bat, the lineup card. Sunday, Barry Bonds hits a 73rd home run ball in the last game of the season. It's caught by a guy named Alex Popoff, who comes to the game, sits in the same place every game, always brings his uh, giant softball mitt. It's, it's kind of just sort of being the size of a bushel basket. <laughs> and uh, Alex is about 6'3", and he's very athletic. He plays lots of sports. And when Bonds comes up to bat, you vacate your seat and you go to sort of an area where Bonds is likely to hit a ball. He sticks his hand up in the air and the ball goes right into his glove That's like good. it was meant to be. He doesn't have to. Said, it's oh just gosh, there and the ball the goes ball. right in. He hey, closes the glove, reporter, grabs it, wraps his, his arms around it, and then he's mobbed by about 12 or 14 people. He's knocked to the ground. His glasses are broken. He's bruised. And when the mob is finally cleared out, the ball's in the hands of a guy named Patrick Hayashi. Uh, there are two theories of what happened. One is, is that in this melee, he drops the ball. The other theory, which I think there's a lot of evidence for, because we have a TV film of what's going on, and we see Patrick Hayashi. Oh he happened to have very distinctive hair. His hair is completely black, except for one swath of gray in it. So we actually can follow Hayashi easily in the film. We see Hayashi literally diving into the pile and squirming his way towards where Popov is. So it's also possible that Hayashi pulls the ball out of the glove and ends up with it. The next day, um, I'm sitting in my office. At the time, I was doing uh, work as an expert witness for a uh, for a, a big Wall Street firm on a on a multi-billion-dollar case, and they needed a historian to um, to explain some things. So I'm working on that. I get a call from the the lawyer I'm working with. He says, "Paul, the the oh, oh no." So so I'm doing that, and that and then that morning I get a call from ESPN, and they want to know who owns this baseball. I didn't even know about it because I didn't care about Barry Bonds and I didn't care about the last game of the Giants because they, they were not contenders. And I just not really cared about that game. And so while ESPN is on the phone talking to me, I'm Googling the story and quickly looking at it. Uh, I'm a quick study explaining to ESPN why Popov owns the ball because he is like Pearson. He killed the fox. He got the ball. Once he has it, once he has possession of it, it's his ball. And if it falls out of his glove, it's still his property. Later that afternoon, the law firm I'm working for, the, the guy, lawyer I'm working with, calls me and says, Paul, the senior partners really love your work. It's great stuff you're doing. But it, what impresses them is that you're on his ESPN.com. <laughs> <laughs> so now we know uh, what senior partners at law firms do all day. And the next day, Alex Popoff calls me. And he says, you want to see the film of me catching the ball? I said, sure. He sends me a videotape of the film. I watch it. I say, if you decide to sue, I'd be happy to be your expert. I immediately, of course, tell him he should settle this case because litigation is obscenely expensive. But he wants to sue. He claims he wants to keep the ball. He doesn't want to sell it. People think the ball's worth $3 million. Uh, you know, the, he claims he wants to keep it. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but in any event, litigation goes forward. I write a a uh, expert's affidavit uh, to get a temporary restraining order to prevent the sale of the ball, arguing that there's a strong legal argument that the owner is Popov, not Hayashi. Okay, so what happens is this: we go to trial. Uh, the trial preparation is amazing, uh, and of course, Popov insists on. Uh, paying his way. Ra the lawyer offers to do it as a contingency, a percentage of what it sells for. And Popoff says, no, I want to keep the ball, so I'll pay my own way. I really think that what Popoff wanted was a ball he thought would be worth $3 million, and he didn't want to have to give a third of it or 40% or to his lawyer. He thought he could get away with a couple hundred thousand bucks, and, and he'd be a rich man. So um, it takes two years to go to trial. The evidence is amazing. We take the film of Popoff catching the ball and being essentially mugged, and we break it down frame by frame. So we have hundreds of single frame pictures of it. We contact every person in the film we can identify. We, we end up interviewing and having as witnesses about three quarters of the people that are standing around watching the pile up, as well a couple of people in the pile up. Uh, one of the people in the pile up is a 12-year-old boy who came home uh, that night with a with a 
with a bloody wound on his leg. And uh, the film clearly shows, I think, uh, Patrick Hayashi biting this kid's leg so the kid will get out of the way so he can get at the ball. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting phenomenon. Um, and so it takes a long time for the trial. We have, I'm on the witness. Rather than standing as a witness in the usual way where I'm cross-examined, the judge declares that he wants the experts to form an experts panel. So we have three experts on our side. They have one on their side. We all give our kind of testimony. I'm, I'm the lead-off hitter, so to speak. And then the judge asks us questions. That, by the way, is held in the moot courtroom of Hastings Law School. And so I start out by talking about Pearson versus Post. And I can hear the students in the audience say, wow, we did that in property law. <laughs> and, 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 and of course, it's kind of revealing, because these students who are reading this case from 1806 are thinking, wow. Now I see the relevance. In the end, the judge decides that the two people have something which the judge makes up, uh, pulls it out of thin air, or potentially some other part of his anatomy. And uh, can I say these things at the Jackson Center? I don't sure. Know. Uh, and uh, and says that the two people, Popov and Hayashi, have a joint possessory interest. In the property, and I'm seeing the judge saying, "What is that?" And the answer is, "Of course, it's the first time anybody's heard of it, and it's probably the last time anybody will hear of it." And he says, "Sell the ball and decide the, the, divide the value." And of course, the problem is, by this time, it's two years after the the event took place. The stock market is not what it had been. Uh, Barry Bonds's stock is not what it had been. So the time that Barry Bonds's ball is sold. The 73rd ball doesn't seem like such a big record. It might be broken next year, it might be broken the following year. And of course, Barry Bonds is not a popular player. He's generally considered to be a pretty unpleasant human being. He won't sign autographs. If you asked him to sign a ball, he'd tell you, get a life. So the Barry Bonds ball sells for about $450,000 at an auction. It's also sold in a very stupid way, an auction house calls up Popov and Hayashi and convinces them they should come to New York. They will get first-class treatment, stay at a, the, you know, a five-star hotel, have great meals, and there will be a televised auction on ESPN of just this one baseball. Well, anybody who understands auctions knows that you can't have a one-auction item. A one-item auction, you have to have an auction. They should have sold, you know, 20 Mickey Mantle autographs, a Babe Ruth, you know, build up. So instead, the auction takes all of about a minute and a half, sells for $450,000. Um, and uh, so Popov ends up with about two and a quarter, and his lawyer's fees are about three fifty. Uh, Hayashi's lawyer's fees were the same, but Hayashi's uh, lawyers uh, decide to waive their fee because I think they realize that the, the publicity, they're a fairly big law firm in, in San Francisco. Uh, uh, Popov was represented by a, um, a very uh, small law firm, actually by a lawyer who's from Binghamton, New York, who ended up in practicing in, in San Francisco, and he simply could not. Uh, write off two hundred fifty thousand dollars or whatever, or three hundred thousand dollars. I never got paid from Popov. He didn't pay any of us, and his lawyer ended up having to sue him to get the money back. So it's it's a sad and tragic story for me. Uh, because aren't I, you glad I asked? I am, no. uh, but I had a wonderful time. The most interesting thing probably was was all the external publicity. Uh, I got calls from um, from radio stations around. Uh, the world, actually, uh, a Scottish radio station, uh, BBC Scotland, called me, and of course, and this it sounds so predictable, it, it's almost like a bad ethnic joke, but it's true. The Scottish radio station wanted to know why anybody would want to buy a used baseball. <laughs> uh, and I got a, and I got a call from an Australian radio station. <laughs> And they wanted me to talk about the fight in the stands. So, you know, I think it's culturally very interesting.